Ladies and gentlemen, let's rise. Ladies and gentlemen, let's rise and prepare to honor the members of the Georgia Tennis Hall of Fame as they enter in the class year in the order in which they were inducted. For the class of 1993, Richard Howell. From the class of 1996, Wendy White Prousa and Joe Becknell. Class of 1997, Horace Reed. Class of 1999, Jerry Caldwell. Class of 2004, Jerry Baskin, John Callen, and Alan Miller. Class of 2005, Lee Sessions Jr. Class of 2006, Jamie Kaplan. Class of 2007, Randy Stevens. Class of 2008, Armistead Neely. Class of 2010, Peter Howell. Class of 2011, Danny Birchmore. Class of 2013, Shannon McCarthy Gaudet. Class of 2015, Richard Bowers. And last year's class of 2017, Larry Schnall and Ham McGill. A round of applause. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Cannon Carr. I'm chair of the Georgia Tennis Foundation. And on behalf of the Georgia Tennis Foundation and our host committee, it's a pleasure to welcome you to join us tonight. That song, it didn't have the words to it, but the song was called High Hopes. And it talks about how tough it is to get to the top. And our Hall of Fame members tonight have shown that you can do it. And it's a rare elite group. So welcome to our members who, of course, could be with us tonight. And of course, we Keep in mind those who weren't able to be with us tonight as well who are members of the Hall of Fame. We have a packed program tonight. Uh, we're, uh, one of the things we're going to do is, is celebrate the Dan McGill Impact Award, which we'll do in a moment. We'll also induct two new members into the Georgia Tennis Hall of Fame. One, a great tennis player in and of himself, and the other, someone who has done a phenomenal, memorable job as a community volunteer. It'll be a pleasure to celebrate those two tonight. And then finally, We'll be going over to the tournament to watch two matches. Hopefully it won't rain. Uh, and it's going to be two great singles matches. So it will be a lot of fun. So lots to do tonight and a lot to celebrate. Before we get started, I do want to say a couple words of thanks. First of all, thanks, as always, to Mark Tipton, if Mark will stand for us. And let's thank Mark. And Iberia Bank. Mark and several of his Iberia Bank member team is with us tonight. Uh, very generous supporting us each year in the work we do and in, in the celebration of our Hall of Fame, so thank you. I also want to recognize our silver partners, Rob Bunnan and Mimi and Evan Hardy. If you two, or you three will stand, please, or at least hold up your hands. Don't be shy. We want to celebrate you all. We thank you so much for that. And then finally, for the host committee, if you members could just stand, please. I'll stand as well, or at least hold up your hand. And uh, we'll thank you all as well. In the last order of business, uh, I wanted to just take a moment and update you on the Georgia Tennis Foundation. Of course, one of the things we do is run this uh, wonderful Hall of Fame celebration and induction into the Sessions Family uh, Hall of Fame Museum. But some of the other things we do are to run summer programs and after school programs in the fall for at-risk kids. And at this point, we're close to, in our 15-year effort of doing that, we've reached almost 110,000 kids and we spent about $400,000 in grant money. So let's have a round of applause for that. It's, it's really amazing to think, you know, when you go out and talk to people about tennis, they think it's kind of a country club sport or an expensive sport or a sport of privilege. But once you see some of the work that we're doing after school and in summer camps through places like the Agape Center or Girls Inc. or uh, through the public school system now, you realize that uh, tennis, is, uh, we think of tennis differently 
at the, at the Georgia Tennis Foundation. It's, tennis is about changing lives and, and about improving communities. Um, you know, when I think just a moment, just about a kid named Preston, for example. I met him two years ago. He's nine years old. Now he's 11. Two years ago, he was the last kid to come off the court. It was 100 degrees outside. There were 80 kids on the court. And he said to me, when are you coming back? Since then, I've been able to go back several times. He lives on the west side of uh, Atlanta. Uh, you know, his dad's not his home. His grandmother brings him to the tennis courts. Uh, I haven't met his mom. Um, but he loves tennis. And I played doubles with him and his, uh, and his buddies a couple times. And I'll think of a woman named Jalesa, who uh, in Rome, Georgia, has three kids, lives in public housing. Uh, through the Rome uh, YMCA, who we do partners with, uh, partnership with, her three kids love tennis. And she said they came home one time and they'd won a prize in tennis and she hadn't seen an element of pride in her kids like she'd seen that day. So you talk about hope and community together. And finally, I'll just mention uh, someone named Rob, for example, who's, uh, who's at the Shepherd Spinal uh, Center, Shepherd Center. Uh, he credits tennis with lifting him out of depression after his spinal injury uh, because he can now play and, and work on his game from a wheelchair. Uh, that's the type of things that the Georgia Tennis Foundation is doing, and we're very proud of it. And then finally, I'll just mention we also support pro grants. Uh, we've got two players we're funding this year. Chris Eubanks played in the qualifying here this year, made it to the quarterfinals last year of this tournament, uh, and Kevin King. Uh, we're proud to sponsor those two players who are in the top 220 in the world. So lots to celebrate from the Georgia Tennis Foundation perspective, uh, and something we're very proud of, and puts in context tonight what our Hall of Fame induction is all about. So with that, John Callen, if you are ready, uh, I will uh, turn it over to John. John, of course, is the, uh, the uh, Chief Operating Officer and Executive Director of Georgia, of uh, the Southern, uh, USDA Southern, uh, great friend of tennis uh, in, in so many respects through the years for uh, all of our communities. Uh, John is going to introduce the Dan McGill Impact Award. Thank you, Cannon, and uh, congratulations to tonight's two inductees. Julie and Ryan, couldn't have two better people than you. I've had the pleasure of knowing you both for over 40 years, and what a great night this is going to be. But the Dan McGill Impact Award, when Richard Howell called me and said, John, I'd like you to present the, the Dan McGill Impact Award, I thought for a moment, and I, I recall back to 1971 as a freshman at Georgia Tech, and that was my first introduction to Dan. And I became affectionately known as the enemy. <laughs> so I thought, well, I wonder what Richard's talking about here. Could he be talking about Impact Award? I thought maybe he was talking about Richard's own serve. <laughs> but that thought quickly went by, Richard. <laughs> but it's a real pleasure tonight to introduce Sheila Evans is this year's Impact Award winner and the inaugural Impact Award winner. And Sheila and I go back to the late 70s at Indian Hills Country Club. And um, I would like to introduce Sheila's family who's here with us. Her daughter, Kim Rayley, and her husband, Brian, and their daughter, Lucy, who's here with us, and Sheila's companion, Lynn Rothman. So would you raise your hand, all of y'all? Thank you again. Let's give that family a great big hand. And, and Sheila's daughter, Kim, was a competitive junior player. And I think Sheila enjoyed watching Kim play more than any parent I know and was the perfect parent. In fact, Sheila, t along with me, took a whole bunch of kids to Macon one year Ryan Blake, you might have been in that group, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but what a great asset she was. And she helped me out at the shop at Indian Hills. But in 1983, Sheila accepted the executive director role with what was then the Georgia Tennis Association, now known as USDA Georgia. And Sheila wore that hat for more than 16 years and wore that hat so admirably. And so many wonderful things happened in tennis in this state in that tenure. And even after leaving the GTA as executive director, she served as the office manager for Alta for several years and also finished her career running the junior program for both uh, USDA Georgia and for USDA Atlanta. But Sheila, there was so many things she was involved with behind the scenes that you never saw. You know, taking everybody back down memory lane just a bit, 
Um, there were four great professional events that happened in her 16 years as executive director. And the first one was the Davis Cup in 1984. It was a quarterfinal match against Argentina. And uh, we had a couple of guys on the U.S. team, perfect gentlemen, McEnroe and Connors, and um, won, won that event. Then fast forward six years, and 34 countries around the world descended on Atlanta for the Federation Cup that was held out at what was then WCT. And at that time, perhaps the greatest 12-year-old tennis has ever seen rose to the top of the tennis scene, and that was Jennifer Capriati. So uh, what an event that was. And, and then in 1996, the greatest sporting event Atlanta's ever seen, the Olympics. And all that happened there with three of the four gold medalists going to U.S. players, Agassi on the men's side, Lindsay Davenport on the ladies' side, and Gigi Fernandez and Mary Jo Fernandez won the ladies' doubles. So three of the four goal went, went to us, but 17,000 players packed those stands every day for matches out at the Stone Mountain Tennis Facility, and uh, what a great event that was. And then a couple of years later, with great work from Lee Sessions and company, we, uh, Atlanta became the International Hall of Fame City of the Year, and uh, Lee, along with Ned Neely, uh, fostered up a Davis Cup match against none other than our good friends from Russia. And Agassi played in that event. So four great events. And Sheila did so much behind the scenes for all of those. And, uh, you know, amazing thing is that she uh, survived the first two presidents of, of the Georgia Tennis Association, me being one, Richard Howell being the other. So to survive those two was amazing. And five of the eight presidents uh, that I believe Sheila served for are actually here tonight. Bernard Neal has passed away, and he was the third. Jimmy Mills, who just adored the ground that Sheila walked on. And Sheila's such a classy lady, and nobody knew that and expressed that better than Jimmy Mills did. And uh, after, after Jimmy Mills was Lee Sessions, Randy Stevens, Julie Regg, Harriet Lynch, and many of those are here tonight, so uh, it's great to have those with us. But the real impact that Sheila made was on the average tennis player. What she did for tournament players, for league players, for junior team tennis players. And just to give you a stat, in 1983, we had 8,000 members of USTA Georgia. When she left 16 years later, we had over 45,000 members. So we grew by over five-fold in that 16-year span when, frankly, tennis wasn't really growing. Tennis's big boom was in the 70s and the first couple of years of the 80s. So for that kind of growth here, and that surpassed anywhere in the country. And so with that, that certainly deserves Sheila to be the Impact Award, the Dan McGill Impact Award inaugural winner, and I'm going to ask Ham McGill, if he would, to come up and present that award to Sheila Evans. Let's give Sheila a big round of applause. <clears throat> Thank you all so much. Uh, this, whole, this room is just filled with tennis lovers, just as, as I am. And um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. That's did he tell all the truth? I'm not sure if he did or not. <laughs> it was all the truth. It was all the truth. OK. But this is great. And I know this is going to be a great meeting tonight for everyone. And I'm really, really proud to be, to be here, both with my family and friends. and. Um, just for all the people that I've known and, and learned to love. Um, so yeah, thanks. Sure. Thank you.
Congratulations, Sheila. Wonderful honor. Uh, thank you, Ham, for presenting. And John, thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, great to have two Hall of Fame members involved there, which now turns us to another Hall of Fame member for the Georgia Hall of Fame, and that is Richard Howell. Richard is the one who leads our induction process, who selects our nominees each year, puts together a great team of uh, about five or six individuals, and we always appreciate the great work they do. It's not easy narrowing down the list. Uh, there's some great talent there. So uh, Richard, thank you for all you've done, and with that, please come on up to the stage. Thank you, Cannon. Uh, it's an exciting night. Uh, Sheila certainly deserved that award, and it will turn our attention now to the Hall of Fame and the primary focus of the night to Ryan Blake and Julie Regg, who I've known for a long time, known as Julie since I, was, I hate to think how young I was. <laughs> and uh, Ryan's father and his wife, Marcia, have been friends of mine since 1985 when I was crazy enough to go into sports agency business and your dad was about my second call and a quick story he told me to recruit this young man from Citadel because he said they don't cheat up there Richard you'll have a chance to sign him <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway moving on <laughs> he couldn't play either but that's another story <laughs> uh, let me say a few words about the, the Hall of Fame. Uh, Ryan and uh, Julie will be the 65th and 66th member in the history of it since it began in 1983. And really proud of the Sessions Georgia Tennis Hall of Fame and Museum, which is located in the GTA building, at Marble Mill in Marietta. It was built, I believe, in 2014. And it's really worth your while to go up there and visit There's a lot of interactive stuff. And for instance, Julie and Ryan's video will be up there soon. Ham McGill goes once a month just to see his own video play. <laughs> Ham made a few remarks about me last year, so I'm getting back here. Uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge several people who were huge in getting the Hall of Fame as an idea and then the concept and then actually getting it done. Uh, Lee Sessions, Dick Bowers, Randy Stevens, Evan Hardy, who's here tonight, Alan Miller did a great job, and Nell Long, the former executive director. Without these people's prodigious work, it never would have happened. So I'd like to give them a round of applause. <laughs> Forgive me for a few minutes, but I like sports and I like history. And, uh, John Skokestead, I, I want to talk very briefly about each Hall of Fame member who's here tonight. Skokestead's not here, but the first one on the list, unfortunately, is Richard Howell, Peter Howell's brother, and Kerry Howell's son. Uh, Joe Becknett, excuse me, Wendy uh, White Prosser, one of the great players in the history of our state, learned her tennis here in Atlanta, was a national champion at Rollins, turned pro, and has two wins over Billie Jean King singles tournaments, give you some idea how good she was. Uh, Joe Becknell, despite a late start, being a ping pong player like Dan McGill, became a master player, won our city championship among many other titles, was a great doubles partner with Jerry Caldwell, Skokestead, and the legendary coach uh, Bobby Dodd. Horace Reed, native Atlanta, our first great African-American player who was met Ours was mentored by the late, great Branch Currington, who was inducted recently in the Hall of Fame, who passed away last year at 91. Jerry Caldwell, nicknamed Strokes, because he doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have any strokes. <laughs> he has done more with less than any player I've ever seen. <laughs> Still winning titles. Jerry Baskin, pro extraordinaire, decided it Early in his career, he was going to concentrate on juniors. And all he's done is had 20 juniors or more play in Grand Slam events, and 300 plus juniors go on to play college tennis. Wild is right. John Callen 
despite what he said about me, I'll say something nice briefly. Uh, John is a real blend, which we love, of a very fine player who's also done so much for tennis on a local, statewide, sectional, and national level for so many years, and we're really blessed to have him in our state. Alan Miller, the young left-hander, the first four-time All-American in the University of Georgia sports history. In my opinion, the greatest doubles player in the history of that proud program. And he won the NCAA doubles with Ola Momquist in 84, 83, close. And, uh, you know, truly world-class doubles player and a fine singles player. Lee Sessions, aptly named the commissioner of tennis in this state. As mentioned, he pretty much ran the Olympics, tennis at 96, brought the Davis Cup here. I mean, the list goes on and on, and his generosity and impact is shown by the fact that uh, the Georgia Tennis Hall of Fame Museum is named for Lee and his family in Marietta, where he grew up. Lee is the fastest basketball player I've ever played with, but he didn't like to pass me the ball. <laughs> he was smart. Uh, Jamie Kaplan, Macon's own, absolute world-class player, had a great college career at both Georgia and FSU, went on to do very, very well uh, nationally and internationally as an adult, returned to Macon, and has had a tremendous impact on that community in tennis and otherwise. Randy Stevens, a great athlete who took up tennis a little late, I think, but as you talk about somebody who's contributed to tennis, in every single area without any fanfare, again, on a local, statewide, southernwide. I think he's been president about every organization that exists in tennis. Armstead Neely, uh, Coach McGill regretted the day he went to Florida, a uh, fabulous player. And uh, Armstead's been a nationally ranked player since he was 11, all the way through the 70s, and really one of the greatest players uh, in our history. Peter Howell, Richard Howell's brother. <laughs> now seriously, Peter has done so much for tennis as a promoter, one of the first people in the Georgia Professional Tennis Association, uh, restored Bitsy Grant to, to its former glory, is now a very successful coach at Oglethorpe and became one hell of a doubles player, nationally ranked year after year in the 35s and up in, in, in doubles. Danny Birchmore, Athens only, Athens own rather, started tennis when he was knee high to the grasshopper. I would go over there to see my girlfriend or later married and at 6.30 in the morning, uh, they would wake up these football players to get them to go eat their breakfast. And I looked outside and Danny was out there with his father hitting tennis balls, 35 degree weather. And I wondered why he got better and I didn't. But Danny was the first All-American in University of Georgia tennis history and won the very highly coveted Osuna Award at the NCAA. Next is Shannon McCarthy Gaudet, another local Atlanta product, a great athlete and a great player. In fact, she went 28 and zero, number one in Georgia. I believe she has the most wins in Georgia women's tennis history and was ranked number one in the country in the NCAA. Richard Dick Bowers, no comment. <laughs> no, actually, to be fair, he has the hardest forehand of anybody in the Hall of Fame, including Ryan Blake. It'd be nice if some of them went in the court. Uh, I was hoping Hugh Thompson would be here to contrast his style to yours, Dick, but he, oh, Hugh came? Great, all right, Hugh Thompson, the antithesis of Richard Bowers, a magical, surgical, who slices and dices everybody, been doing it for God knows how many years, and one of the best players in the world for his age. Uh, Larry Snow, an absolute, absolute world-class doubles player who, uh, despite learning tennis on some kind of crazy courts in Marietta, went on to be an All-American at West Georgia. And truly, I mean, at 45 years old, he's out there with Ryan Blake playing top teams in the country, in the world, really, in that, in that AT&T tournament. He's 75 now. 
Ryan said he carried him, but actually Larry told me just the opposite, Ryan. <laughs> and last and least, Ham McGill, no, seriously, Ham was number one in every age division in Georgia, won the state men's title, was one of the greatest Princeton team in history, and honestly had probably the best one-handed backhand with a wood racket in the history of this state. So anyhow, that may be more than you wanted to know about the folks tonight, but I, seriously, I wanted to recognize them and thank them for being here. Let me turn very quickly to Julie Regg. And, and Ryan, I don't need to say much because we're gonna have a great video, but Julie's impact on tennis is literally unsurpassed, probably in the country. And Ryan Blake, I, I thought Ryan was a real quiet, shy young man because I was around him with his father who was a wonderfully loquacious and great storyteller. And Ryan never got a word in edgewise when I was with him. But it turns out he's quite the character, just like his father. And some of the stories I've heard, I can't repeat tonight. <laughs> but he became a terrific player. I did try to get Coach McGill to recruit him. But at that time, they were just signing phenomenal player after phenomenal player. And Ryan was late to tennis. He was a three-star athlete in other sports. But anyhow, enough of me. Could we cue up the video on Ryan Blake, please, Justin? Ryan Blake's journey on the tennis court has taken him from a great high school athlete to collegiate player to world-ranked professional and even coach. Along the way, he's traveled the world, winning matches and making people laugh all the way to the Hall of Fame. Well, well deserved. Um, he will be one of the more interesting characters in the Hall of Fame. He will add to the Hall of Fame as much as it adds to him. You know, from a young kid, 10 years old, all the way up to now when he's 51 years old, coaching, you know, coaching college tennis, though, it's, it's been an honor to watch him grow out, you know, grow through the years. At 11 years old, Blake began his career at the Rivermont Country Club in Roswell, where his parents, Marty and Marcia, were recreational players. Blake's mother ran local tournaments and officiated at the U.S. Open and Davis Cup competitions. Well, we belonged um, to Rivermont because the neighborhood we moved in didn't have a pool. My kids were all young, so uh, we started playing tennis there. And he watched us and he started playing on the junior teams there. And that's how he got started and he went from there. Blake's first coach was Hall of Famer Larry Schnall and his early instruction helped Ryan find success at the junior level. I think he got most of his talent from his mother, Marsha, because I used to coach Marsha as well back in the day, so I can see where Ryan got his talent from. Blake was a three-sport standout at the old Peachtree High School in Dunwoody. He excelled in football, basketball, and baseball, but when the coaches wanted to make him a lineman, he chose to focus on tennis. Well, he's actually just a tremendous athlete, and. I don't think he, he actually became a good junior player till sort of the end of high school. Blake was a tall, powerful player with a strong serve and forehand. How heavy and how hard he can hit the ball is it's actually kind of amazing. By his senior year of high school, Ryan started to make a name for himself. He was the state singles runner-up in the GHSA Quad A tournament, the highest classification at the time. Despite his high school success, he was not highly recruited but did get an offer from Georgia Southern, where he would end up playing both number one singles and number one doubles in Statesboro from 1986 to 1988. With his talent level, uh, if he had started a few years earlier, he probably um, easily could have played on the Georgia team um, instead of a, a lesser team like Georgia Southern. So he started a little bit late. Of course, he made up for it uh, later. After graduation, Blake did not plan to play professionally. But after working out and holding his own with touring pros Dan Cassidy and Barry Moore, they convinced him to give it a shot. I don't think Ryan understood his potential uh, and his ability uh, when he was just out of college that uh, not only would he beat these guys, he would beat them to a pulp sometimes. He was, he was an incredible athlete uh, and uh, it was a good decision for him to turn pro. I think that's... Uh, uh, it set him up for, he's still involved in tennis, it set him up for his whole life. Ryan Blake played professionally from 1989 to 1995 and won tournaments across the globe. He played qualifying matches at Wimbledon in both the U.S. and Australian Opens. And in 1994, he won three qualifying matches back-to-back -back 
to qualify for the main draw at the Australian Open. During this time, he beat many top 50 players, but his most notable win was over former world number one, Patrick Rafter. What got him through that time was being incredibly competitive uh, and having an incredibly strong uh, sense of uh, being able to accomplish anything he set his mind to. So grit and determination got him through that six years on the tour. Now, not every tournament that he played in had the facilities of a Wimbledon or Flushing Meadows, but that never stopped Blake. Once he even brought home a trophy from Southeast Asia. I had a chance to uh, uh, go to India a few years after he played, and the hotel I was staying at was right next to the National Tennis Center of, of, of India in Delhi. So as soon as I got home, I, I called Ryan up. I said, did you play there? He, he starts laughing. I, I said, I said, where did you stay? He said, well, we, we stayed in the dormitory, which I'd gotten a tour of. He said it was, it was 50 cents a night, unless you wanted a towel, and then it was 75 cents. After leaving the tour, Ryan Blake continued to play locally, winning the Atlanta City Open singles title. Later, he would capture the 30 and over Atlanta Senior Invitational. Then in 1997, he teamed with his old coach, Larry Schnall, to win the wild card qualifier at the AT&T Challenge in Atlanta. He would then do it again in 2000 with partner Chris Decker. We just had a fantastic time doing that, you know, and today I'm still grateful for him carrying me, you know, throughout all our matches throughout the year. So, but to be out there playing against number one seeds in front of the crowd, it was just um, nothing like it. Despite a stellar career on the court, Blake may be best remembered for his wardrobe choices, or rather, lack thereof. It's a big uh, intersection with all the states in the South, and it was played in Huntsville, Alabama. And Ryan did incredibly well. I think he was in the 45s, but the funny thing was, the only people he looked like were the maintenance guys at the, at the tennis center. He didn't look like any of the players. <laughs> but, so he's kind of always been known to not necessarily wear a tennis shirt. and Some of his rackets may have been in the closet for a couple of years, but you can't underestimate him. He can really play. You can't judge him by the way he dresses on the tennis court because sometimes he'll come to a match, he'll either have his Budweiser shirt on, his road furniture shirt on, or a bowling shirt. He's always in, uh, he's always in um, basketball shorts and high top tennis shoes. So you, you really can't judge Ryan by the way he looks because uh, the next thing you know, uh, you're shaking hands and um, I've had one opponent come off and says, I think I just lost to a rodeo clown. And I said, no, that's Ryan Blake. Blake has been a head professional at the Sporting Club at Windy Hill and the Country Club of Roswell. He's currently the head pro at Town Lake Hills in Woodstock and is a volunteer assistant men's tennis coach at Kennesaw State University, where he has found tremendous success working with college players. If you don't have a connection with your student athletes, there is no way you can coach them. Um, he has been able to build that connection in a very short period of time. Um, our team trusts him on the court, off the court. Uh, he's a lot of fun to be around. Um, he's very intense, uh, of course, very knowledgeable. Uh, and that's a, a complete package that uh, very few people have it. Uh, and he has it, he has it all. Uh, I think if he wanted to be um, a full-time college coach, uh, he would be one of the best in the nation um, for sure. These days, Blake still picks up matches around the area and works as an NBA scout. He's a great natural athlete with an incredible will to win. And that probably got him through more matches than anything else, was that he just would never give up. Uh, there's a lot to be said for that. Congratulations to Ryan Blake, a 2018 inductee into the Georgia Tennis Hall of Fame. Welcome, Ryan Blake.
that, uh, that video pretty much struck to the core. And at 52 years old, I don't have much core left. So uh, seriously, thank you, Scott Singer Salon, for all the hard work you put into the video, especially for the hard work, uh, the lots of hours you put in the prep work for Larry's um, makeup, I think. <laughs> Uh, I would like to thank the Georgia Tennis Foundation. I am extremely humbled, uh, especially to be honored alongside a pioneer and a legend in her own right, Julie Regg. I think her story needs to be told loud and often as she continues to be an inspiration to boys, girls, and adults alike. So congratulations, Julie. Now, as I understand, Richard, um, I only have 60 minutes to speak, so I need to, to get going. Six to eight minutes, Ryan. What? Six to eight minutes, not 60 minutes. I guess you didn't get the intel report on me, so I'm going to go ahead and apologize in advance. Um, all right, so listen. Tennis has been the second most important thing in my life, behind my kids and my family and my friends. Uh, many of those friends that, are, are, that I've met or coached through tennis are here tonight, and I'm truly touched. And, and those friends throughout the world have become my family. My kids, Elijah and Sarah Jade, are here. My brother, Elliot, from Iowa. Uh, my sister, Sarah, and her family from Atlanta, and of course, my mom, Marcia. I also want to recognize that we have lost a few of my, my Georgia tennis heroes throughout the years, um, people that I've, I have admired. My, my good friend Mark Abedikian, Georgia Maya, who I was lucky enough to play with, a sweet soul individual. I got to be friends with Herman Bubba Radcliffe, and there's many more. And those guys I meet, I miss deeply. And I feel lucky that I've known these guys. They're great men. Now, I've had many people that have inspired me, mentored me, and have helped me with a sport I truly love. And most are from the greatest tennis state in the world, Georgia. This is our state. I would like to talk to you about some of these people. And due to con time constraints, um, these may be short, but um, it's very important to me that these people are the, are, are, that I get to recognize them. All right, first, the person that catapulted my limerence in tennis was John Callen. From when I first began tennis to going to the camps at Big Canoe and to being my only coach ever, junior coach, he made the, gun, the game fun on and off the court and he also made my game so much better. So for your patience, for your belief in everything that you did for me, probably more patience than anything, thank you, and I love you. Jim Hodges. I met Jim at Northside Athletic Club, and he was the person that gave me the confidence to play on the circuit, to ask better players to play. And he set the foundation when he told me that I needed to compete harder than my opponents. He also told me to enjoy the journey, and no matter what, when, not if, I win a tourna tournament, to bring that trophy home. So, Jim, for everything you did for me, and of course, for your friendship, thank you, and I love you. Next, Larry the Doodlebug Schnall. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know, Larry, of course, was my first coach at Rivermont Country Club, but he was also my first boss. And when I started teaching after I quit the circuit, I quickly realized I didn't know how to teach. As an instructor, he gave me the confidence to work hard to be the best that I could be. I could see how much fun he had teaching, and it resonated with his students. But he also gave me the confidence to create my own lessons, to be creative. Now, Larry was a solid mentor. He really was. He used to tell me stories of how he grew up 
you know, playing in the juniors uh, along with the same people in the same age group like Bill Tilden and, and Fred Perry and Don Budge. Um, as a partner, now Larry, Larry was, I mean, he was, we matched up competitively. He had to compete in everything. Uh, at one, at w one time he took me to his hometown, I think it was in Mableton, Georgia, I think it was. And uh, he wanted me to watch him compete as the reigning champion in his own county's cousin kissing contest, <laughs> which of course he won again. Um, now, the, the benefit I have with Larry is I, I still get to play alongside him uh, and, and watch him frustrate 20 year olds, which and I'm not talking about the waitresses and hooters, I'm talking about the, the, the people on court. And that's impressive for a 72-year-old. 62? Three. Well, you look great. Larry, for all your help and friendship, thank you, and I love you. Now, I want to talk to you about Dr. Jim Hayes. I met Jim Hayes at Northside Athletic Club as well. And after a year on the circuit, Jim came to me and offered his financial assistance to help me continue my dream of playing on the tennis circuit. What I didn't expect from Jim was a coach on the court and off the court. But this was positive. He taught me how to be a professional. He taught me how to have a professional approach to the game. He got me in the best shape of my life. He taught me about loyalty, about accountability, about trust. He taught me about how important friendships are, not only in tennis, but in life. He also taught me, encouraged me to compete, and this was really important. So here's an example. One year I was playing in El Salvador, and I was settling in for the night before my semifinal match. When the um, El Salvador guerrilla rebels decided they were going to try to attempt to take over their hotel and the president's palace down the street. So there was helicopters, tanks, mortars, gunfire, bombs, and just chaos. And I ended up getting back to my hotel room, and I ended up getting a call out to Jim. And as I was lying on the floor, I opened up the, the sliding glass window to the balcony, and I put the receiver out, and I let him listen to the war. And as, after I complained for about 10 or 12 minutes, he said, well, Ryan, he goes, do you think they're going to play tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. But then he said, do you think your opponent wants to play tomorrow? And I said, copy that. You got to want it more than the other guy. And as a result, the next morning, everything was clear. We got escorted across the street, packed stadium. And before that coin toss, I made sure that my opponent knew that I wanted to, that match more than he did. And when I looked in his eyes, I knew that he knew that I wanted that match more than he did. As a result, I got to my second consecutive professional tennis singles finals. Jim, for everything that you've done, for everything, friendship, and everything that you are, thank you, and I love you. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to talk about my mama. I'm right here, baby. Um, I know, mama talk, but listen, she's the reason why I got into tennis. And it wasn't that she pushed me into tennis. I used to watch my mom and my dad play, and I wanted to be a part of that. Now, my mom later became a USDA referee. She officiated in the Davis Cup, U.S. Open, NCAAs, many tournaments. She was also a tournament director. But I also had the benefit of having at my fingertips that USDA rule book, rule book all the time. It was like having that tennis magazine, the Alta magazine, where you could write in and get all the answers, and she had every single one of them, and she was always right. If I, did, if I didn't think it was, she'd throw the rule book at me and say, look it up. Now, my mom played and ran tournaments at Bitsy Grant, 
And this is where I knew I wanted to pursue this sport full time. I used to watch Bitsy Grant play, the Howell brothers, Joe Becknell. I mean, many guys that are here. You just don't know how much I looked up to all you guys. You see, there was a sense of romanticism that I loved about this game that I knew I had to be a part of. And my mom gave me this. So I got to tell you the story. When I was in ninth grade, my mom signed, signed us up for this National Equitable Family Tennis Challenge. It was a mother-son event. And if you won the local, state, regional, and sectionals, you got an all-expense trade paid trip to go to New York to play at the U.S. Open during the U.S. Open. By chance, we got to the final match. And we also were playing an, 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 a very experienced 18-year-old and a very good mom. And we got to the third set. We got to the third set tiebreaker. But back then it was that tiebreaker that was five points, the no add, right? So what, whoever got to five first, that was it. And we were down three match points. But I was serving those three match points mm -hmm. against us. And I had the hammer. <laughs> I had the hammer serve. And I brought that hammer down on those first two points. And on that last match point, I'm serving to the sun the mom was cowering over there at the other side of the doubles alley, and I brought that hammer down one last time to the bottom of the net. <laughs> and on my second serve, I went to toss my second serve, and as I looked up, I saw my mom looking at me. And I realized then that if I double fault, then I'm going to have to spend the next hour and a half in the car with my mom going home with an angry mama. And as I released the ball, which hovered about my shoulder area, I went to kick serve. It ricocheted off of every part of my Prince Pro aluminum racket, went to New York, California, came back, hit the mom in the doubles alley in the leg. But, I put my hands in my face and I, I was disgusted with myself. And as I listened to the celebration of our opponents, I finally gathered myself and I walked to the net to shake my mom's hand and to congratulate my opponents. But my mom wasn't looking at me. She was at the net shaking her finger. And this is what she said. Excuse me, excuse me. Um, I'm a USTA official. Um, that ball did not hit, your, uh, did hit you on the leg. It did not hit the ground. That means it's our point, it's our game, it's our set, it's our match. <laughs> Said, son, get your bags. We're going to New York. <laughs> and as I walked to shake my mom's hand, she had this little disgusting look on my face, like, what, what just happened? Like, and I walked up to her and I said, well, mom, does that count as an ace? <laughs> mom, for everything that you've done for me in tennis and all that other mom stuff, thank you and I love you. Now, Richard, I apologize if I went longer than the six or 12 minutes that you gave me to thank the people that made this possible, but uh, this is six minutes that I never would imagine I'd ever have the opportunity to thank everyone. So for that, everyone here, and with all my heart, thank you.
How about that talk? Uh, while we're waiting just a minute, I'd like to recognize and thank Salon Kunian, our executive director who puts on this event. Truly does a great job. She, she's had double duty this week with another event two nights ago. So thank you very much, Salon. I uh, also want to thank Scott Singer of Workhorse Productions, who's been a great addition to us. He's done our videos and whatever the last couple of years, and it's just been fabulous. And I, I recommend people, if you need a videographer, Scott is absolutely terrific. And I would like to acknowledge two people, can't resist. Mark Price is in the back, and Coach Homer Rice is here. In my humble opinion, without getting into trouble, Mark Price is the greatest basketball player in the history of Georgia Tech. And without Coach Rice, Georgia Tech would have become Emory in athletics, frankly. He, he, uh, he brought nothing against Emory, Division Three. I guess. Without Coach Rice, there wouldn't have been a Bobby Crimmins, there wouldn't have been all sorts of things. And really one of the great athletic directors in United States history, as well as a great football coach. So I wanted to mention that. Okay, now it is time to cue up the video on Julie. If you'd cue it up for us, Justin. Thank you. From tournament director to chair umpire at the U.S. Open, co-founder of the world's largest citywide junior tennis league, four-term president of the Georgia Tennis Association, or the first women's coach at Georgia Tech, few in the Hall of Fame have more qualifications than Julie Ray. I think that she's amazing as a person and what she's done for me and done for our sport and done for Georgia Tech. I uh, just can't say thank you enough. So to be recognized in this way, she, in no, she for sure is a Hall of Famer. She's a Hall of Famer and always will be. You do read these articles and see these things about you know, her career. I mean, you, she's a legend. You know, she's been around all aspects and she's given her life to it. And uh, it's amazing when I look back at it how much her life in tennis has defined my path and my life. Julie Rake, a native of Charleston, West Virginia, found tennis at an early age after an injury slowed her down from another passion. We in the sport of tennis are just really lucky because, because of, a, of an ankle injury. Uh, Julie was a, was a figure skater and uh, she hurt her ankle and somehow managed to take up tennis. Julie quickly dominated on the court, becoming a nationally ranked junior player she would go on to lead her high school team in Sarasota, Florida to three state championships. She would also find success in the classroom. In fact, she was her school's valedictorian. Her academics would push her to Atlanta, and in 1961, she enrolled at Georgia Tech. Uh, she was ranked in uh, the, top, uh, the top 15 in the USTA uh, in Maryland. And uh, I know she won the West Virginia Open singles. But Julie was a highly ranked uh, junior player and uh, was uh, uh, brought to Georgia Tech by uh, then Jack Rogers. Reg's freshman year housing plan at Georgia Tech fell through. But one day, while at the Bitsy Grant Tennis Center, she would meet one of Tech's biggest tennis boosters, who may have held another title as well. She was there at Bitsy Grant playing tennis, and Bobby Dodd, who had heard her story, about her not having a place to live, comes up to her and invites her basically to stay at their house, his and his wife's house. One of the legends of Georgia Tech athletics. And here she is coming in as a freshman female at Georgia Tech and gets the opportunity to live with the legend Bobby Dodd for six weeks. Phenomenal. When she arrived at Georgia Tech, uh, there was no women's dorm. She uh, was sort of out in the cold and it hadn't been for uh, the generosity and kindness of Coach Bobby Dodd. She might not have been at Georgia Tech, but uh, she is, uh, as you know, uh, a member of the Georgia Tech Athletic Hall of Fame, and, and they are fortunate, and, and certainly so are we. While at Tech, Reg played on the Yellow Jacket men's team because there was no women's at the time. 
A few years later, in 1964, she'd partner with Ann Dillon to win the women's doubles title at the Atlanta City Open. The following year, Reg became the first woman to graduate with a physics degree from Georgia Tech and was recognized as the school's most outstanding female graduate. One of the things that people don't know about her, I don't think, is that, uh, that she worked in, on some metallurgy for bolts that were used in the uh, second stage of the Atlas booster rocket that sent people to the moon. And uh, so she's really a rocket scientist. Reg began to teach tennis locally in the 1970s and volunteered in both Alta and the USTA. She took a special interest in junior players and tournaments. And in 1973, she co-founded the Alta Junior League, which now has over 7,000 players. Well, Alta obviously was a great pioneer of adult league tennis uh, a few years earlier, but Julian Fox founded the, the uh, Alta Junior League, and that kind of set forth uh, an explosion of junior tennis in Atlanta. In 1976, Reg brought the USTA Girls 12 and Under Nationals to the Bitsy Grant Tennis Center, marking the first time that a girls' national championship had been played on Georgia soil. Two years later, the USTA Girls 14 and Under Nationals would come to the North Fulton Tennis Center. She was then named tournament director, a position she would hold for the next 26 years. And for her to bring the first nationals to Atlanta brought great recognition to Atlanta and also really uh, invigorated a, a volunteer base that has been serving tennis in Atlanta through today. Julie Regg served the USTA as an umpire and referee for over 25 years. She was a line and chair umpire at the U.S. Opens in both 1978 and 1979, officiating matches with several high-profile players. Julie was one of the great female chair umpires, and uh, she worked the U.S. Open on several occasions. She's uh, been a tournament director, been an official for many, many years, uh, served on the USTA Officials Committee, uh, been involved in, uh, in every aspect of the, of the game of tennis at the professional level. Reg went on to serve four two-year terms as president of the Georgia Tennis Association. Julie was a consummate volunteer and uh, she served not once, not twice, not three times, but four times as the two-year president of USDA Georgia. And uh, no one's done that. In 1979, Julie Regg started the Georgia Tech women's team and served as its first head coach until 1986 and then again in 1992. She started the tennis team at Georgia Tech. She was the very first coach there and uh, um, you know, laid some, some nice foundations there and, and, and really kind of helped uh, integrate tennis in with the, the larger sports community there. The program initially competed at the Division III level and finished in the top 10 nationally in only its second season. Reg once had 12 high school valedictorians on her roster, and her teams compiled 86 victories despite offering no scholarships for the first several years. I remember her talking about tennis and tennis matches in general as, as being like tests that you go take uh, in school. And you go out on the court to play against an opponent, and you've got about an hour and a half to solve solve the problems that, that arise. And I think that's how her mind works. She's a problem solver. She's not someone that just focuses in on just the problem, but someone who looks towards the solution. So for her to get those great students, the ones that could think on their feet, put the thought with the action, those are ideal student athletes for, for coach. Throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, Reg was on the USTA Tennis Rules Committee and served as chair of the USTA Girls 12 and Under Rankings Committee. With her husband, Doug, she developed tournament software that exploited new technology, the internet, and revolutionized the way tournaments were run. In the old days, of course, you know, the only place you, you, you know, sports scores you couldn't get from anywhere. But uh, with it, there was a, a tournament management software and then a website where you could see stuff. So people would play tournaments over a weekend and then they'd see their results on the web. And of course, then you have all the data available for rankings. And so it kind of revolutionized the way uh, tennis was done. She also wrote the tournament manual, the Bible for running a successful tennis tournament. She was the first person to write a tournament director's manual. She put together and struck things to do and, and good practices. And it was adopted virtually word, by, word for word by the USTA. Julie Regg's most recent venture, TennisRecruiting.net, 
is now the best site for information and stories on junior tennis and recruiting. It features rankings of all U.S. junior and college prospects and is a perfect tool for college coaches and recruits alike. We use that rating system more than we use the USTA rankings. That's how important her system has become and how much it is viewed and how much it is, it is used throughout, throughout our country. Julie Regg's unique six-decade tennis journey has helped careers and touched lives. You know, she, she goes through life without a lot of fanfare. I mean, she, she's always given a lot. I mean, just from giving lessons uh, to neighborhood kids, to, to coaching. I mean, it's always been about the sport. It's always been about, uh, that, that, those are the kind of things that she's always taken a lot of pride in and not a lot of personal fanfare. So I, I think it's well-deserved and I'm, I couldn't be more proud of her. Congratulations to Julie Rag, a 2018 inductee into the Georgia Tennis Hall of Fame. Please welcome Julie Red. Like you, I don't know where to start after that. Uh, I do want to first before, so I won't forget, and I may be in tears by the end of this. Thanks, Salon, so much, and thank Richard very much for keeping after me for quite a few years. I'm really going to enjoy this now. Salon, you told me three minutes. Now this is my three-minute version, but then I saw Ryan come up here, and this is my longer version. So. <laughs> Uh, Ken, and I'm really humbled. This is, this is great. It's great to see so many friends here and have so many people come in here from out of town. Uh, I have been fortunate to be a player, and you didn't acknowledge that, Cannon, so I'm going to get on you a little bit. But uh, teaching professional umpire and so forth. But I'm going to tell you about a match I played when I was very, very young. I was lucky enough to go play on grass first time, went in the day before, and and warmed up a little bit on grass, and I thought it was kind of fun. I learned to play in, on clay in Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, but grass was interesting. So I went to check in with this lady. This was in New York. And she was older, and she was taller, and very well built. But you know, I was 15. I thought I was pretty good. And we went out on the court. We warmed up, and I thought, boy, this is a really nice game we're going to have. I'm really looking forward to this. And I won the toss, elected to serve. And my first serve was like the old Pancho Gonzalez serve that went halfway up on the sideline. She didn't return it, and I thought, okay, I can count on that point every once in a while. I won the first game 40-15, and I was feeling really pretty good. Now, back in my day, Haley, back in my day, uh, you sat down after one game. So we sat down on the bench, and she started making conversation with me. And, that was pretty unusual, because in junior tournaments, you know, you don't really sit down and talk with your opponent very much. I don't remember what she said then, but I will tell you what I remember saying it for one in a minute. Now, she went back to serve. She served the first ball, and I don't think I saw it. Okay? It went, I don't have no idea where it went, but I was looking at the motion, because Jim Layton, who was my former coach, who some of you may know, was the Wake Forest coach, uh, had told me that, you know, you, you can't really tell anything about warm-up. You really need to feel somebody out that you don't know for the first four games. So I thought, well, that's okay. So the first serve was fine. She served the backhand court. I got the ball back. My backhand was by far my better shot, and you know, a lot of people didn't know that early, so people would play the backhand. And I won the next point. It was 15 all, and I was still feeling pretty good. The next shot, she served down the middle, and I hit, I thought, the one of my better backhands return serve, a little bit high, but I didn't expect her to come in as gracefully as she did, took that backhand volley, and again, I don't know where it went, but I was watching her. I mean, this woman was phenomenal. So at 4-1, we sat down, and I decided I would start the conversation, and I said to her, I said, you have a really nice game, and she said, thank you, dear, and then we never ran now. I realized she's older. Well, I went on to lose that match, 6-1, six, 6-love. Six, I did ask the umpire how long it lasted, because my coach wanted to know that. 
and uh, he's, uh, it was an hour and 28 minutes. So uh, you can see I did get a few points during there. And so I immediately called Jim Layton, my coach back home, and I said, Jim, our coach Layton, I said, I, I lost 6-1-6-love. Six, six, he said, well, of course you did. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you just played Althea Gibson. She just won Wimbledon. So there are two people, actually three people, but the third one will wait for a little later. There are two people in my life that really uh, I have to mention that are no longer with us. One was my mother, who a lot of you had the pleasure of knowing. And the other one was Coach Layton, who the NCAAs were just at Wake Forest. They were playing on some Layton courts up there. This was quite the, the gentleman. He taught me to be a student of the game, and that's, I think, why I enjoy playing Althea so much, is because I don't think I really remember hitting a ball after two or three games, because she was just such a gracious player and person. Some 30 years later, at Washington Park, the Georgia Tennis Association was having a, a clinic, and she will remember this, and we invited Althea to come and kick off this clinic at, at Washington Park. It had just been redone. And so I went to the airport to pick her up, and we were driving to the thing, and I said, Althea, I said, I know you're not gonna remember playing that match in the first round years ago, but I said, you beat me 6-1, six, 6-love. Six, and she acted like she remembered, which I know she didn't. But I said, you know, did you give me that first game? And this was so great. She said, honey, I never gave the first game. Boy, did I feel good about that, and I've, <laughs> that's one of the best matches I can remember in my entire life. I was born in West Virginia, and somebody here tonight, please put, Ms. Moore, put up your hand. Okay, well, I want you to stand up, because there's a gentleman over here from West Virginia. Go ahead, please, hand, stand up. This is the daughter of my first mixed doubles partner, who I absolutely dearly love from Charleston, West Virginia. He, she, he taught me the love of doubles. And I want you to see this gentleman afterwards, because he's from Charleston, West Virginia. So small, small town, but great tennis town. Oh, Harry and I were, uh, were, were quite a team, and when I decided to come to Georgia Tech, uh, Coach Layton and Harry told me I had to look up Jack Rogers at Bitsy Grant Tennis Center. So my mother was here for the first few days. By the way, she had left by the time Coach Dodd picked me up from nothing. Uh, but at any rate, I, I, looked, I went out to Bitsy Grant Tennis Center, and on court 13, there's a tree up over, and I don't know if it's still there or not, Peter, but there was a tree, and I sat down underneath this tree to watch these four gentlemen play. There was a little short guy that absolutely controlled the court. There was a fellow that slammed a forehand like you have never seen. Uh, then there were two other gentlemen playing also. This was Bitsy Grant, Tom Bird, Larry Shippey, and the one and only Bobby Dodd with the windshield wiper volley. And I was absolutely mesmerized. I don't think I moved for an hour and a half sitting there watching these gentlemen play. Uh, I then met Ralph Foster, who everybody met if you went to Bitsy Grant. And Ralph told me, he said, do you need somebody to play? And I said, sure. He said, well, you know, there's this little lady out there. She's gray-haired. You can go ask her if she wants to hit a few. And I said, well, no, no. I said, Mike, can you go get her to come and ask me? Because, I mean, I was 17 years old. I wasn't going to go ask this lady that looked like she was 45 to go play tennis. So he did. He went and asked her. And so she came and asked me if I wanted to hit a few. And I said, fine. We got out on the court. And I think I hit 10 balls, and she wanted to play. Well, I mean, I was used to warming up. I mean, this is you know, in the days where you didn't just have a five-minute warm-up. You went out, and you warmed up before you played. Well, not with Natalie Cohen. An hour and a half later, I came off, dragging off the court, 6-4, six, 6-3, six, loser. I, I think I may have beaten Natalie a few times, but I know I didn't beat her more than she beat me. Uh, love, absolutely love the lady. She introduced me to Ruth Lay, Carrie Howell, uh, some of the greats of Bitsy. And any, of course, anybody who was anybody, as Ryan will say, played at Bitsy Grant Tennis Center. So that was my home, away from home at Georgia Tech. I think that... Uh, I picked up some doubles partners along the way. And there you go about playing again, Cannon. Ann Dillon from uh, Georgia State University. Uh, now realize, when I picked up partners, like with Harry Moore, I always looked for the best partner I could find. I loved tennis dresses, and I loved my hair to look nice. And I did not like moving on the court, did I, John? <laughs> or Peter, OK? Okay, I, I made sure that they understood that I was, and I also, also like to play the backhand court. 
and that was very unusual to find a fellow, a guy that would let me play the backhand court. Joe Pearson was one of my favorites, Jerry, as you know, and Joe loved the forehand court, and I would tell him, look, there's no problem. Usually, now, when you're in the backhand court, your overhead's in the middle, but don't worry, I'm going to be so far over, your overhead could still be in the middle, and you can have three quarters of the court, and I'll have my little piece over here, because I didn't want my hair to get messed up, or my dress to get too wet, or anything else. So my partners were Bill Mallory from Georgia Tech, who came into Tech the year that I did. Uh, John Callen, I picked up along the way. I, I don't know why these guys said yes, but they did. Uh, Peter Howell, Larry Shippey. And Ryan, if I had been younger, I would have picked you up too, I promise. <laughs> Now that gets me to about 1967, um, <laughs> so I'm a little older. And I, the first day of graduate school, this really good looking kid, a boy walked in, sat down in the front row. Now, re graduate school, there were eight of us that stayed after I graduated to physics, and, but there was this one new guy. And he walked in and he sat on the front row and he walked right out after class, but I thought he was cute. And I said to this guy next to me, Gil Emilio, who some of you may have heard of, he's been CEO of every organization going, I said, Gil, you have to figure out who that is because I want to marry this guy. And so Gil, Gil wasn't the least bit interested in finding out who he was until some of you were old enough when your professors used to post the scores on a little sheet of paper on their doors. And this guy, his last name started with W, and he was the last guy. So Gil always had set the curve, and he went up to look at the scores, and he didn't set the curve that day. This new guy did. Then Gil got very interested in finding out who this was. Well, it turned out to be my husband of just 50 years last week, Doug Ray. Now, like another good friend of mine in the audience, I'm an only child too, and, and I'm, I'm sure spoiled rotten, uh, but Doug has put up with me for a long time, allowed me to do everything I wanted to do in tennis and otherwise. Uh, and as, as, you, as was mentioned, Fox Farrell and I started the Alta Junior League, which was really fun, and who do we bring to town but Jim Layton to kick it off over at East Lake Indoors. During my first tenor, I think, at, in, as the Georgia Tennis Association president, I went down south of town to watch a tennis match. And this match was between two very good players at the time. And the director was defaulting one of them. And this director turns out to be Robert Salisville, who by far is my best friend in the entire world. And Robert defaulted the guy, and the guy came late, and he said to Robert, well, I'm going to call the Georgia Tennis Association president and complain about you. And Robert says, you don't have to call her. She's sitting right over there. <laughs> so that was my first introduction to Robert. Yes, he and I have run tournaments together for years. He now, Natalie started me doing the Georgia Junior Championships, which is, I think, celebrated its, what year, Robert? We're up in the 60s, I know and it's now up in Rome, Georgia, and the, the Girls 14 Nationals still stays in Georgia under the direction of Robert Salisville. Now, I got into Ub Paragon, and I, it was really kind of fun. Natalie got me, Natalie Cohen or Jim Layton got me into everything I got into, and I did get into Ub Paragon, and by 78 and 79, I was asked to go to the Open, and the first year you go to the Open, you don't chair matches, you call lines, but I was on a match between Eddie Dibbs and Guillermo Vilas. Uh, I'm going to re regress a little bit. I have to tell you my Nastassi story first, because Ely and I got along actually pretty well. He didn't like women umpires, but he put up with me. And one time he put up with me because he asked me in the fourth set if he could go change his shirt. And I said, certainly. And he very prim and properly went behind the backstop at the grandstand at the US Open and he had, wore Adidas clothes, as you'll remember, the three stripes. And he had green stripes on when he went out. And when he came back, back, he very proudly showed me that all the way down his arms and his legs, he had on navy blue stripes. Now, this means he had changed everything right there behind the backstop. And I thought, oh dear, we have a problem. 
uh, I'm going to have a big problem when we leave the court. He, I was asked to fine him, at that point in time, $15,000, but I wouldn't sign for it because I said, look, here was the deal. It was late match. The only people that could have seen anything with him at all were sitting up here on the back row making out, and they weren't the least bit interested in what he was doing behind the backstop. So I didn't sign. Now, that same year, Velos and Eddie Dibbs were playing, I think it was a quarterfinal match, and I'm on the sideline. Dibbs hits a ball to, at the end of the fourth set, it lands right on the line. Now I'm on the far sideline, chair umpire's on that side. I called it good. First thing I knew, and I, you, you made your call, you looked at the chair. Now, Doug didn't believe this until recently he found out that my chair umpire had one eye. He had a glass eye on his right side, which was my side, which means he wasn't looking at me at all. But here's the problem. Somebody got out of the stands and came and stood in front of me. Jan Tyriak. Now, for, it, go look him up if you don't know who it is. This guy is the sleaziest, slimiest looking person you've ever seen. I think he speaks 15,000 languages, and he said every one of them to me. I don't know what he called me. I don't care what he called me. All I was doing was sitting there thinking, I have children who are nine and six at home. What am I doing here? This guy's getting ready to kill me, and I'm still, I haven't moved yet. I have the whole good line, and the, and the chair's up there. He didn't see anything. He didn't call for security, but he's sitting next to Destasi. And Ely says, no, no, Jan. He says, you come back, you come back. She didn't find me. It's OK. You come back, sit down. <laughs> so, so we go to the fifth set. Velos loses to Dibs. Man, I was off that court so fast because I did not want to have anything to do with them anymore. OK, so now one more thing while I was there. Mel Purcell, the great Mel Purcell from Kentucky, was playing a match late. And they needed a chair umpire and nobody wanted to volunteer, but I did. Now, it's very unusual for a person from the same section to call a match for the person from that section. I said, oh, I'm not from Kentucky, I'm from Georgia. And actually, I may have said West Virginia just so I could call the match. So I go out to call the match, and there's this little short guy watching the match for the first three sets with a great big bodyguard next to him. And I thought, golly, that guy looks just like Kenny Rogers, the singer. Well, Kenny Rogers sponsored Mel Purcell. It was Kenny Rogers. But anyway, so now we get in the fourth set, and Mel and I have known each other for years. I raised him all through my junior tournaments, but I told him, I said, we're going to get on the court now. We don't know each other because we don't want to get in trouble with Mike Blanchard and whatever. So I said, what we'll do is you just do your thing, and if you have any problem, you come to the chair and you call me Mrs. Reg. He says, yes, ma'am. So he comes to the chair in the middle of the fourth set, and he said, Ms. Reg, I don't mind if you call that baseline back there, because that guy's sleeping. But he said, the problem is, he's snoring when I throw my ball up to serve. <laughs> he said, you, you have to at least wake him up enough that, that this is not going to happen. So I had my service line and power go back and wake up this gentleman. He was older, and it was, it was late. It was, I think by now it's about 1.30 at night. And... So things were going along fine. It looked, I kept watching him. He wasn't nodding off. But all of a sudden, he did go back to sleep. He fell out of the chair. He was removed. We, we moved the service line to the baseline, and Mel won the match. So it was all good. I told Mel, I said, you learned to concentrate really good with somebody snoring as you threw the ball up. So I come home, and I had had a great time at the open run powering, but I thought, you know, I could never go back again and have such a good time. Nothing could eclipse the, the, the year I had just had. And it, it didn't, because at that point in time, the then athletic director, Doug Weaver at Georgia Tech, came and asked me to start the women's tennis program at Georgia Tech. And I thought, oh dear, I had never thought about coaching tennis. I mean, I was in my 30s, what am I gonna, you know, this had to call Jim Layton, who else, right? To ask Jim Layton what, what I could do. He said, Julie, he said, coaching college tennis is such a wonderful thing because you get to mold somebody for four years of your life, their lives. And he said, it's just, you will love it, absolutely love it. Stop smiling, Kim. So I started the program at Georgia Tech, had to go to the PE class to get some players because we didn't have any. My second year, though, I'll tell you, I had 16 players on the team, and 12 of them were valedictorians. And we went to, uh, well, we got to the Nationals. Now, here's the problem, though, too. I had been there seven months, and we had a new athletic director come in. And this athletic director was shorter, 
and I uh, didn't really meet him because I was just a little Division Three coach. He had more problems with Pepper Rogers and hiring a new basketball coach than he worried about my little Division Three team. So we made nationals though that second year, and I thought, ooh, I don't have any more money left. We didn't have a great big budget, but we had plenty of budget and so forth for what we needed to do, but not to go to nationals. So I got very brave, went in and sat down with Ms. Harrell, his secretary, and I got to meet Dr. Rice, and I asked him, I said, may I have money to go to Salisbury, Maryland? We've qualified for nationals. He said, of course, but didn't really ask me how much, because I didn't know what it was going to cost, and off we went to nationals, and all the bills were paid. And I don't think I saw him again until the next year when we qualified for nationals again at Princeton. And I went in and asked him again for money to go to nationals. And he said that fine. And off we went to nationals. I will tell you that working for Homer Rice was probably one of the greatest experiences in my life. Absolutely the greatest uh, athletic director Georgia Tech has ever had. And it was my privilege to work for him. What's also interesting in those Division Three years is that the University of Georgia wouldn't play us. But we at Georgia Tech hosted a state championship, and every team in the state came. Georgia Southern came. All the teams in the state would come play at Georgia Tech. I think we had one year we had nine teams come. The next year we had 15. But the University of Georgia wouldn't come until all of a sudden they realized that Georgia Tech was winning the state championship of Georgia. And then the University of Georgia started to come over. And yes, they beat us. They were Division I. We were Division Three. But then we went Division I. Now, this presented a problem because, again, I had Division Three players who came to Georgia Tech to be at Georgia Tech first and play t little tennis second. And I went in to see Dr. Rice, and I said, I have another problem. I said, I need some money for a tennis scholarship. And he kind of looked at me and he said, in state or out of state? And I said, out of state, because I said, I have an eye on my girl, the girl that I want. And she had played in my tournaments for years. And I thought, if I can get her, she was from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And that happened to be where Jim Layton was. OK, here we go with Jim Layton again. So I called Coach and I said, Coach, I need your help getting this girl. He said, oh, her daddy's going to be a hard one to crack. But he said, well, let's see what we can do. He said, I'm going to do a clinic this weekend. Why don't you drive up? and help me with this, do this clinic for these underprivileged kids. She said, he said, her dad will be there. Well, not only was her dad there, but Kim came. And Kim had played in the 16 Southerns with me two years, and I had gotten to know her and really, really liked the way she played and how she acted on the court. And this is the girl that I wanted to give my first scholarship to. I worked on her dad, I can't tell you how many times, and finally he said, Missy, he said, I'll give my daughter to you, but he said, you do right by her or you're going to have to answer to me. And I've remembered those, those uh, words for a long time. Kim Lash, here with us this evening from North Carolina, was my first scholarship player. Now, Kim is a great player in her own right. She held the record for women for singles wins at Georgia Tech, and it was only eclipsed in that great year of 2007 when Georgia t women's tennis team won the first and only NCAA championship that Georgia Tech has ever won. <laughs> ever won. During that final match in that tournament over at Athens, Georgia against UCLA, I was on the phone with Kim, and I said, Kim, it's 40-15. You know, we have match points. And she says, yes, coach, I know. You know like 40-15, Kim knew what the score was. I was so nervous I could barely talk. And you can't imagine that, I know. But anyway, so uh, Kim, uh, we lost that point. I said, Kim, it's 40-30. It's still match point. She says, yes, coach, I know. And I said, Kim, we might win this match. We might be, we might be champions. We did. The crowd went into whatever, and I couldn't say a word to Kim. I just started crying, and I just hung up the phone. And I don't know how long it took Kim to find out that we really had won the match. So it, uh, it was a great time. And also, while Kim was at, at Georgia Tech, a great thing happened. We uh, got a, a, excuse me, a basketball coach named Bobby Crimmins, and Coach Crimmins 
was only hired, I think, Homer, I hope I'm telling this story right, Homer probably wanted a better, bigger name coach, but he took Bobby Cremens, I think, as a stand-in until he could get a better name coach. But the problem was, Bobby Cremens got John Selly and Mark Price, and then John Selly got Bruce Dalrymple, Oh, excuse me, and then Bobby Crimson got Bruce Dalrymple and Dwayne Farrell, and time after time after time, we had the freshman of the year. And in 1985, I think that's right, Mark, right? We beat North Carolina at home. We beat them away, and it had never been done before. We beat been the third time in the finals of the ACC tournament. It's the greatest memory I've had in basketball. Thanks, Mark. Well, believe it or not, I'm through two pages, all right? Um, Robert mentioned something about this. Robert kind of got, uh, well, actually, I started typing up draw sheets at home and pre-reproducing them the next day at Nationals because I wanted the girls to have something to take home. If they had lost that day, I wanted them to have a draw sheet because they had played at a USTA National Championship. So I would go home at night, type up the stuff, take it to FedEx, go to bed, get up in the morning, go back to FedEx, pick up the stuff, and come back to the tennis center. And I decided there had to be a better way. Robert had tried some tournament software by somebody, but it, it, I didn't know anything about it. And I gave Doug a honeydew project to just do some draw sheets for me, just so if I typed in the name one time, I could then let the people progress out to the next line. Well, he did that. And of course, then once he did that, I wanted it to do more. I wanted it to schedule. And as you all know that have run a tournament, Marsha, I know, scheduling is just not the easiest thing in the world to do with, with by person or not. But Doug did. Uh, he did pretty much, remember I told you I was an only child and stubborn and spoiled. He did pretty much everything I asked him to. And by the way, honey, I love you. <laughs> okay. uh, then in 1999, it was a great year. This was the first time that Doug and I were blessed with a grandchild. And Lindsay's here with me tonight from North Carolina. She's on a full merit scholarship at NC State, and I am so proud of her. Since then, Dallas and his wife have given us two more grand granddaughters, and then Shannon and Laura have blessed us with two grandsons. So we, Doug and I are in seventh heaven with five grandchildren. In 2001, I don't know why Doug didn't go, but Shannon and I went to the open. And we were watching, we were there for meetings, and all of a sudden, Todd Martin was winning, Agassiz was winning, Sampras was winning, and all of a sudden, I'd realized that the Agassiz-Sampras match might be on the night that we had tickets in the president's box, John will remember this, for that very famous match. And this was a match like no other. I'll never see another tennis match like this. You had Sampras with his serve and his aggressive behavior, and then you had, the, by far, the best return of server ever in the game with Agassi. And there were no breaks in the match, and you'll remember this, and if, I would urge you to go watch it sometime if you, you again, because I've watched it several times. The first set went to a tiebreaker, and Pete had three set points, but lost them all and lost the first set. And you could see the momentum really going over to Agassiz's tie. Next set went to a tiebreaker, and I don't remember, oh yes I do, the first point of that tiebreaker was a great one. Agassiz served to Sampras, wide to the forehand. Pete hit the ball a little bit off, off center and hit a very weak return. Agassiz came in and just hit a bullet down to, to Pete's backhand. Pete goes over there on a full run, still don't know how he did it, and hit a slice that left Agassi standing still. That point, I think, made the difference in that tiebreaker. That was the mini break, and Agassi, I mean, Sampras went on to win that one. The fourth, the third set, rather, I don't remember, but the fourth set I do again, and Pete Sampras's backhand won that tiebreaker with two backhand passes down the line. It was just a great, great match. Uh, one that Shannon and I got to see. We actually rooted probably a little more than we were should have at that point in time, but it was a great, great match. Uh, again, I, I have to thank Brian Shelton, John, Peter, all the ones that spoke for me this evening, my two great kids. 
I love you all. I do thank the Georgia Tennis Patrons Foundation, and thank you so much, all of you that came to be with me this evening. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you all for, uh, for coming out tonight. Thank you for your, your attention. We do want to just say congratulations once again to Ryan, to Julie, and to Sheila. You know, it's an honor to be here to celebrate with you three tonight. It's an amazing achievement. Uh, it's something very special. And I'll tell you what is just wonderful about it, too, is not only hearing the stories behind the legends, but hearing the people involved with them and who's been special to each of you. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and stories with us tonight. Very well done. All right. So as a final close, thank you again to Mark and Iberia Bank. Thank you to our silver sponsors. Thank you to Richard. Thank you to Salon, putting on a great show as usual. Thank you to our Hall of Fame members, and thanks to all of you for coming out. Now, it's time to go watch some tennis. I know Ivo Karlovich won the first set. I think, against uh, Donald Young, so we got to go cheer Donald uh, on to victory if he can do it. Uh, and we will see you at the suite. Anything else we need to know? We're in the City View this year. Right, we're, well, it, new for us this year, we're on the City View suite, which is kind of the 50-yard line. So it's actually going to be that, right when you come in, it's going to be the, the right on the street side, right on, on closest uh, to the Atlantic Station. But we'll point that out. Uh, anything else? Look for golf carts to take you over there, or you can walk. We're adjourned. Thank you.